Mirrors and reflection of light. When light hits a surface, it can do one of three basic things. It can either be absorbed by the surface or the material. If it's a transparent material, it can pass through the material, or it can reflect off the material. Let's focus on reflection here. There's two types of reflection. Specular reflection, reflection off a smooth surface, or diffuse reflection, reflection off a rough surface. Now, smooth and rough are somewhat relative in a sense. That's why I put these in quotation marks. For example, a gym floor is smooth for a basketball, or most balls, but for light, it's not really smooth. It has microscopic little bumps in it, so it doesn't act like a good mirrored surface for light. Here are some diagrams at the bottom here, or on, the, on your notes. This represents specular reflection. The incoming light rays are all parallel, and they bounce off all parallel to each other. They each obey the law of reflection, and you have a nice specular even reflection. The second diagram here is representing diffuse reflection. However, each individual light ray is obey still obeying the law of reflection. If you were to draw the normals there, it's just that the surface itself on a microscopic level for light has what it looks like a bunch of bumps on it. So it's unpredictable in a way it will bounce off that surface. So most surfaces in life are diffuse reflection when light does re reflect. Now a mirror, however, is a surface that produces specular reflection. It's, uh, well, most polished metals make good mirrors. Glass is not really a good mirror. Although glass is used in mirrors, it's not really the, tr um, the reflecting surface of the mirror because glass itself reflects roughly 4 to 5 percent of the light that hits it. Glass is transparent. The light passes through. What they use glass for in mirrors, it's, a, it's the material on which they basically paint the metallic paint on the back surface. That is the reflecting surface of the glass, not the glass itself. So once again, the glass is only used to have something transparent that the paint can be painted onto as the reflector. So let's talk about some of the terms involved with mirrors and what's happening with mirrors. First of all, what you see, quote unquote, in the mirror is usually not in the mirror. It's usually behind, or you'll find out later, in front of the mirror, as you see in this diagram here. Let me explain this. What you see is what we call the image. It's an appearance of you or whatever is being projected in the mirror. It looks like the object, in this case the object is a woman, and the image is something that looks like the woman. One difference, as you know, in a flat mirror is that the image, quote unquote, in the mirror is left-right reversed. If you raise your right hand, your image in the mirror raises its left hand. We'll talk more about that later on. But let's talk about some terminology here. Virtual images. Virtual images are images in which light only appears to come from the image. The image is always upright, and it can't be projected onto a screen. We'll talk about that in class. A real image, as you'll see later, is when light actually comes or converges to form the image. This image is always flipped. It'll be flipped, so it'll be like upside down if the object is right side up. It can be projected onto a screen. Once again, we'll talk about that and give you some examples in class. We'll come back to that. But let's talk about this plane mirror, this flat mirror here in this example with this woman. All right, whenever you have a flat mirror, the image is always virtual. It's upright, and it's created by what, a, what light light that looks like it's converging. The image size, believe it or not, is the same size as the object. And a full-length mirror is actually only half the size of the object. So let me explain this with this diagram. So here's what happens. Whenever you see something like with color, you see things because there's light going into your eyes. Let's start with this person's foot. All right. If I start with this person's foot, what's happening is you have to have your light on in your bathroom or wherever you're at, and light bounces off your foot, and there's light bouncing off your, your whole body everywhere, 
But one ray of light in particular, starting with the, you know, basically the, the lowest part of your body, light leaves your foot, bounces off your foot, bounces towards the mirror. There's a lot of light from your foot that's not going towards the mirror. But that particular ray, one ray of millions you could draw, bounces off that mirror, follows the law of reflection, the two angles are equal, and that ray of light goes into your eye, this person's eye. But your brain says that light travels in a straight line, so this person's brain says her foot is over there. It's not really over there. We know that. But your brain is telling you it is because we know light travels in a straight line. If we take the other extremity of, her, of this person's body, the top of her head, there's some light reflecting off her head. A lot of it's not even going to the mirror. It's going to the other parts of the bathroom or wherever you're standing. But one particular ray of light follows this path, a little bit down, reflects off the mirror into this person's eye. Now, those two extreme rays define basically the position of her image quote-unquote, behind the mirror. In other words, her brain tells her once again that her head, the top of her head, is over here, quote-unquote, we say in the mirror, but it's not really in the mirror. It's behind the mirror. Now, there's nothing back there. It's, it's essentially an optical illusion. It's not really you back there, but it looks a lot, well, it looks identical to you except for the left-right reversal. But what I want to prove to you is that this mirror here is only half the size of the person. The full-length mirror only needs to be half your size. For example, let's make it easy on ourselves. Let's say this person is a six-foot-tall person. So from her bottom of her feet to the top of her head is six feet. I'm going to assume for now, and we'll show you in class, you can just go up to a mirror and put your hand on a mirror. And when, when you put your hand on a mirror, your mirror image in the mirror will be the same size as your hand. All right, and that's true whether you're right at the mirror or you stand back. We're going to prove that to you. In fact, you know, all you got to do is, you know, look in a mirror and walk backwards and your image, quote unquote, walks backwards. It's an optical illusion that's walking backwards. If you walk forward towards a mirror, your image walks forward towards the mirror. It turns out that your image is just as far, quote unquote, behind the mirror as you are in front of the mirror. So if I just drop a line here, let's say that this distance right here is four feet. Four feet. This little tick mark means feet. So what happens is, or what we can prove geometrically, is that this is four feet. And all you got to do is just walk yourself in front of a mirror, towards a mirror, behind, uh, back, it, back up, or walk forward, and you'll see that your image does the same thing that you do in reverse. All right, now, from simple geometry, if I draw a triangle here, starting from this person's eye, whoops, and draw this triangle, all right, that triangle there, this, this leg right here, is six feet. This woman is six feet tall. All right, this mirror, by similar triangles, since it's halfway between where the image is and where the girl's actual eye is, since that mirror is halfway between the object and the image, it has to be three feet tall, just by similar triangles. Hence, this girl, six foot tall girl is using a three-foot mirror, half her size. And this will work no matter how far she is from the mirror. She can back up to 10 feet away. It always turns out that the mirror she's using is half her size. So why do they have full-length mirrors way, way bigger than three, three feet? Well, you know, if her child wants to come, say she only has a, a four-foot tall child, all right, the mirror would need to be lower for that child. And three feet would be a plenty big enough full-length mirror for a four-foot child. They would only need a two-foot mirror, but that mirror would need to be closer to the ground because, for example, in this case, the top of this mirror has to be slightly below the top of her head. For example, if the top of her head was four inches higher, let's say, yeah, well, let's say six inches higher than her eyes. The top of her head is, say, six inches higher than her eyes. What has to be true here is that the top of this mirror needs to be three inches lower than the top of her head so that the light from the top of her head, as it goes to the mirror, tran um, travels downward three inches on the way to the mirror and, transfer and then uh, travels three more inches downward as it goes into her eye from the mirror back to her eye, total downward displacement of six inches to get that light into her eye. So if there is six inches between the top of her head and her eye, this mirror needs to be located three inches lower than the top of her head. You know, six feet minus three inches is five foot uh, nine inches. So the top of the mirror would be at five foot nine inches. 
and accordingly the bottom of the mirror would be at, what, 2 feet 9 inches. So a full-size mirror really only needs to be half the height of the person so that you can see your entire self in the mirror. Let's talk about curved mirrors. There are two types of curved mirrors, and the red you see here in this diagram represents light. Mirrors, curved mirrors can focus light. Flat mirrors cannot focus light. The mirror on the left here is a converging mirror. It's caved inwards. It's a concave mirror. We'll talk more later about why it can produce real or virtual images, and it can magnify things to make them look bigger. The mirror on the right is a diverging or convex mirror. Also, that one's sometimes called a negative mirror. The concave mirror is sometimes called a positive mirror. Once again, I'll talk more about that in a future video. But in these cases, the concave, the converging mirror, causes light to converge at a point we call the focal point. So I'll kind of highlight that up here in the diagram. This point right here, we call that F, the focal point. For the convex mirror, and, oh, and by the way, what you'll see me do in class is the reflecting surface here, assuming, say, this is a metal surface, doesn't really matter, but it's metal. I will do this with little marks on the back. That represents the back side of the mirror. That's the non-reflecting side. So you see that kind of in these diagrams. I'm not going to ruin the second diagram here. But the reflecting surface, we're essentially going to do all our problems conventionally from left to right. The light will be coming from the left, bouncing off the mirrors, and then bouncing off back to the left. So the light's traveling towards the right when it's coming in and bouncing back out towards the left after it reflects. So on the diverging mirror here on the right-hand side, once again, I didn't draw all the normals here, but if you were to draw the normals, each reflected ray will follow the law of reflection. And what you get here in this case is what's called a virtual focal point. It's a virtual focal point. And we use an F to to label focal point. Now it's a virtual focal point because the light doesn't actually go through the mirror. It reflects off the front surface, but if you project backwards, that's the apparent spot from which the light looks like it's coming, even though it's not coming from there. It's coming from the left, hitting the mirror and bouncing back towards the left. It's as if it was focused at that spot. Let's talk about some of the mirror terminology and formulas. There is the object, and different books use different letters, but I'm going to use the letter P, lowercase p, for the location of an object. I'll give you an example here in a few minutes. It's how far the object is in front of the mirror. It's always going to be positive in our cases. And then we have the image, which we're going to call Q. Its location will be Q, how far it is also from the mirror. And it can be positive or negative. It can be measured in meters. You can do it in centimeters, but our standard unit will be meters. Let me go through some of the terminology here. So I'm going to run through all the terminology here, and it won't make a ton of sense right now. I'll give you more example prompts tomorrow, but I'm going to fill this all in so that you have this as a reference page for future problems, because everything is going to be summarized on this one page here. You can, mirrors can magnify. Some mirrors do. The curved mirrors can magnify. Magnification is the ratio of the image size to the object size. The focal point is going to be labeled with an F. The focal length will be labeled with a small letter F. It's the distance from the mirror to the focal point. Capital C will be the center of curvature of the mirror. R will be the radius of curvature. That will be measured in meters. Okay, The center of curvature is just a point that will be labeled as C. It's not a measurement. The radius will be a measurement the actual radius of the circle. Capital F will be the focal point. Once again, it's a spot or a point. It's not a measurement. Little f will be the focal length. So that will be measured in meters or centimeters, but meters are standard. Lowercase p will be the object location from the mirror. That will also be measured in meters. We will measure that or calculate that. Little q will be the image location. In the example I used with the 
the flat mirror with the woman. Her object, her object location was four feet, and her image location was four feet. For flat mirrors, your image and object distances will always be equal. Capital P will be the object height in meters, and capital Q will be the image height in meters. For Once again, for the girl in the mirror, the flat mirror, her height was six feet, her object height and her image height were both six feet. Once again, flat mirrors are easy. The, the height and size of the object will be the height and size of the image, and they'll be equally located on either side of the mirror. The magnification has no units. It's a ratio of the image size to the object size. Once again, in a flat mirror, in a flat mirror, M equals 1 for that girl in the flat mirror. Now, on the right here, little f is positive for converging mirrors, the concave mirrors, and it's negative for the diverging mirrors. I'll explain this with some examples tomorrow. Little p is always positive. Once again, this is a summary of everything. Little q is positive for real images, which will always be inverted or flipped. Q will be negative for virtual images. Those are going to be upright. Lens power is 1 over the focal length. That's an equation. Lens power is 1 over the focal length. The units are inverse meters, meters to the negative 1. Sometimes that's called a diopter. Uh, a diopter equals meters to the negative one. That's what a diopter is. The focal length of a mirror is one half its radius of curvature. I'll give you an example tomorrow. But the most important equation is going to be this. One over little f equals one over little p plus one over little q. That's the relationship between the focal length, the object distance, and the image distance. Once again, I'll give you the example tomorrow. There's two ways to calculate magnification. Magnification can be calculated by taking negative Q over P, both lowercase. That's one option for calculating magnification. The other way to calculate magnification is capital Q, the, ob the image height, divided by capital P, the object height. Tomorrow I'll give you some examples on how to use these equations. Let's go to the last page here quickly. All right, to polish this off, even though it won't make a whole lot of sense, save this page and I'll explain it more fully tomorrow. We'll be doing what's called ray tracing. What's going to happen here is we'll have rays of light, for example, number one, an incident ray parallel to the principal axis, which I'll define tomorrow, will be reflected through the focal point. We're going to use this to explain how mirrors form images. An incident ray through the focal point will re be reflected parallel to the principal axis. In, in a sense, rules numbers one and two here are just the reverses of each other. And finally, an incident ray through the center of curvature will be reflected back on top of itself. Once again, I'll explain that tomorrow, but Use this page as a reference for all the problems we'll be doing for homework in the future.